Good morning, Destiny. I am so proud of all of our graduates. Can we give them another round of applause? So exciting. If you want to take pictures with your families afterwards, we have a little photo booth for you set up in the back, but we are just so proud of you. It's an exciting time of life. It's a milestone. I didn't have any graduates this year, but I did have three daughters in our high school. So next year I'll have a graduate, and then the year after that I'll have a graduate, and then it's just going to continue on for the next 12 years. Well, my name is Alicia. If you don't know who I am, I am one of the campus pastors here in Yuma, and I get to share the word with you today. We have been going through a book as a church since the beginning of the year called The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. How many people know what I'm talking about? Yes. Who who's, has the book at their house and has read it? Okay. That's probably like maybe 20%, maybe 30%. So that means there's a bunch of people in here that are missing out on an incredible book. Pick it up. You guys, you can get it for free on Hoopla. You can get it on Amazon, on your Kindle. It's a great book. It is a foundational book for your Christian walk and your relationship with God. It's the fundamentals, and it will really challenge and encourage you. It'll make you go, I don't know if I really know what it means to love God fully. And it will encourage you to go to the next level. So if you don't already have the book, go ahead and grab it. It's great. A couple of weeks ago, Levi was preaching on chapter seven called The Gaze of the Soul. And he was encouraging us to spend time in the presence of God, to understand the character of God. And when we understand the character of God, we understand what he wants of us, and what he wants to do. It's incredible. So if you miss out on that, we have all of the sermons on our app, and they're on YouTube. You can go back and watch them, but pick up the book if you haven't gotten it already. Today we're going to be continuing on with chapter 8 titled, Restoring the Creator-Creature Relation. So that's a long title because it was written by Tozer a long time ago. But it means we're going to restore the relationship of us, the creation with God, the creator. Amen? So everything we go over today is directly out of this chapter, and we're going to have a bunch of quotes from Tozer, but this is all written by him. All the content is from him and the Holy Spirit, so we're going to give him all the credit, and let's go ahead and pray, and we're going to get started. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that your desire is always for us to be with you. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be convicted this morning by you, Holy Spirit, to come into a closer relationship with you, to leave behind everything that causes distraction in our lives so that we can have a correct, ordered relationship with you that blesses our life and blesses you, God. We love you and we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to start this off with a short but very important verse. We're going to read Psalm 57, 5, and it says, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. So we're going to break it down. Who is supposed to be exalted? Who is supposed to be exalted? Okay, is everybody going to participate today? Okay, great. Where does the writer want his glory to be? All over the earth. Not just part of the earth, not just in our lives, all over the earth. Say all. So right off the bat, we're immediately confronted with the word and who is supposed to be the highest and most praised above everything in our lives. It is supposed to be God. So here's how the chapter opens. A.W. Tozer says this. It is a truism, which just means, hey, there's nothing that we can say other than this is actually true. It's a truism to say that order in nature depends upon right relationships. Say right relationships. To achieve harmony, say harmony, each thing must be in its proper position relative to each other thing. In human life, it is not otherwise. So we know that that's true about nature. Have you ever been stung by a bee and gotten mad that bees exist? And then you remember, oh wait, I won't have fruits and vegetables if bees don't exist. That's kind of important. So there is a specific order that nature depends on and in our lives it's the same. In order for our relationships to be right, we have to have the correct order. If we wanna have harmony, but it, would anybody here like harmony? Yes? I want harmony in my life. I don't know about you, but there, there's a lot of problems that come up on the daily, and harmony is something that I want. That means that everything's working together in order. So if we want harmony, Tozer says what we need is order, and order in right relationships. So throughout the book, Tozer's been talking about this from the very beginning, since we started going through this as a church. He's been talking about the fact that all the causes of our human miseries come back to this dislocation of our relationship with God. 
So if you think about, you guys, look at the world. Think about the world that you know right now. And think about the fact that the, all the human misery that we see is because there is a dislocation in the relationships that people have with God. And if we can restore that, that relationship with God and to each other, we would have harmony. Isn't that good? At the beginning of time, it started with Adam and Eve in the garden, and they chose to be disobedient to God by eating the fruit that he said not to eat. And at that moment, that was the sharp change in our relationship with God. They chose to be disobedient. They, they adopted an altered attitude towards God. They had the attitude of, man, God is awesome, and he's in charge, and we love him, and we walk with him every day, and it's amazing. And then they chose to do what they wanted to do, and there was a sharp change in their relationship. There was an altered attitude that came into Adam's life. And the thing that Adam didn't realize was that the correct relationship that he had with God was what tied his true happiness to his life. When he stepped out of the order that had been created, the correct order of that relationship, he lost that. So the fall of man was the sharp change or the dislocation of the correct relationship between us and God, but salvation is the restoration of that right relationship. It's bringing back to normal the creator-creation relationship. So anybody here ever dislocated something in your body? A couple people? Is it painful? Yeah? I, my daughter, I was telling everybody last night, my daughter Elizabeth, when she was three years old, she's 17 now, she dislocated her elbow. She was laying on the bed taking a nap, and she wanted to sneak away from the nap and pulled herself off the bed while she was holding my hand and dislocated her elbow. And she was screaming in pain. And we were new parents, so we immediately took her to the ER. And the doctor told us that this is a very common dislocation for children because they're always pulling away from the person that's holding their hand. Imagine that, children trying to get away from the authority. So that dislocation that came from disobedience caused her a lot of pain. But it was very simple. The doctor showed us how to, I'm doing this because this is the movement that you have to do to relocate it. It's really weird. You put it over your shoulder, lift it up, it relocates the elbow. I'm a pro at it now because she did it probably four more times throughout her life. And we stopped going to the ER because the doctor showed us how to do it. So as soon as you relocate it, the crying stops almost immediately. It's wild. And so I realize, hey, my kid will be okay if we can just relocate this elbow. If we can relocate this relationship, the, if we can fix the dislocation, we will stop the pain and the misery. This is for us and it's for the people all around us, amen? So that's the goal today. If we wanna have a satisfying life, we have to have that change in our relationship with God. And if we want that harmony, we have to go, you know, it might just be my relationship with God. If I'm feeling disharmony in my life, if I feel, am I feeling that pain? I might need to get this relationship relocated. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to examine if we have the order established, and we're going to find out why it's so important. Number one, we must begin with God. I want you guys to say that with me. Say, we must begin with God. I want to read you this quote by Tozer. It's a little bit long, but it's incredibly important because it's how we get to the beginning of it. In determining relationships, we must begin somewhere. There must be somewhere a fixed center against which everything else is measured, where the law of relativity does not enter, and we can say is and make no allowances. It's very difficult in the world today to do this because everybody says, well, that's not my truth. And if we don't have a truth to center everything on, then how can we find the right location of things? If I can't say this is a glass of water, then what, what is it? So God is God. Such a center is God. When God would make his name known to mankind, he could find no better word than I am. When he speaks in the first person, he says, I am. When we speak to him, we say, he is. When we speak to him, we say, you are. Everyone and everything else measures from that fixed point. I am that I am. God says, I change not. I don't know about you, but I need something in my life, a fixed center that doesn't change because everything else around me is constantly changing. God is that point. And that just means that God is like the North Star. He is the thing that we can guide our lives by. We can begin with him in everything and we can get our moral bearings from God. Amen? 
We are right when and only when we stand in a right position relative to God. Has anybody here ever built anything? Billy? (laughs) Billy builds everything here. When you try to build something and you don't have a correct angle, which not one angle in this church is straight or right, (laughs) because we built it all. But when we try to build something like on a wall here, we have to find a correct center to start with. We can't go, oh, that wall's straight. We'll start with that wall. We cannot. We have to get a level out. We have to get a level out so that we can find the correct center and we have to measure everything. If you don't have that, then you're going to build it wonky and it's going to fall over. (laughs) Trust me. God is that thing for us because if we stand in a right position with him, we're going to be right. But We are wrong when we stand in any other position. It's that simple. So when there's difficulties in life, and we see this with a lot of Christians and people who are seeking spirituality, these difficulties all stem from an unwillingness, say unwillingness, an unwillingness to take God as he is and adjust our lives according to him. Has anybody here ever tried to plan a trip and you're going to go visit family? And when you go there, you would think, oh, man, I'm traveling so far. My family should want to adjust their lives to come see me. But then they're like, oh, you can come visit me at this time, and then you can travel over here to see this person. And then you're adjusting your whole life to go do all those things. Isn't that crazy? But how many times do we expect God to adjust himself to what we want? We, say all, we, say, we hear people say, my Jesus would never do something like that. But when we're saying things like that and when we're expecting God to adjust himself to us, we're trying to modify him and make him in our image. But whose image are we made in? We're made in God's image. That's right. We can only get the right start by accepting God as he is and learning to love him for what he is. And this is the incredibly exciting part. When you start to get to know him better, you realize that you're so happy that he is what he is. You love it you realize, man, God, you are way better than me all the time. I have thought many times I wanted something my way. (laughs) Anybody else here thought that? You wanted it your way? Raise your hands because I know all of you want it your way all the time. You're a bunch of liars in church if you don't admit it. I have thought many times I wanted something my way, but when I gave it to God and allowed him to be who he is and to do what he wanted to do, I realized that I could have never imagined how good it could be. And there's times that I did it my way and I realized this could have been a lot better if I had listened to Jesus. And I stand in awe when I look back at situations in my life where I could have made disastrous decisions and by the grace of God, I just waited for what he wanted. I'm so thankful for that. I'm also thankful for the mercy he has on me when I don't do it right, but he allows for that. That's what his grace is for. Can you imagine if we could change God to what we want? We don't want to do that. How painful would it be to find out the reality of that choice if you changed God to what you wanted? But let's begin with God. God's number one. He is above all, before all, first in sequential order, above in rank and station, highest in dignity and honor. He is the highest. Say number one. And I'm going to tell you some verses why that is true. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning... God. What was in the beginning? So was he before you or after you? Before you. Okay, so he automatically wins. He was here first. God created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 103 says, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. Whose are we? His. Okay. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Revelations 4.11 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Since he was at the beginning, and since he was the one that made us, we get to have the only attitude of he is Lord, and we get to be submitted to him. That's it. There's no other options. We owe him every honor that is in our power to give him. And if we, at the end of our lives, find out, I did not give God all of the honor that he was due, we are going to be filled with grief. I don't know about you. I know I'm already going to be sorry about a couple of things that I didn't do right. And I don't want to be filled with more grief or sorrow for not giving God all the honor that he deserves from my life. Amen? This whole pursuit of God thing comes down to embracing the hard work of bringing our total personality 
into conformity with his. We say, you made me, and now I am going to choose to become like you. And we're not talking about our salvation. That's the justification that we have before God is completely by faith. There's no work involved in that. Jesus did all the work at the cross. We are already given the chance to have complete salvation through the cross. That's paid for. That was free because of what Jesus paid. But now we get to do the work, the work, say work, of conforming our lives to be like Jesus. And that is a voluntary thing. He is never going to make you do that. He is going to allow you to choose to do that. When we put him in, our, in his, per, his proper place and we willingly surrender our whole person, then that's where we're supposed to be. That's the correct order. I want to read you this quote. It's great. Chozer says, the moment we make up our minds that we are going on this with this determination to exalt God over all, we step out of the world's parade. Anybody want to be in the world's parade? Luke said specifically, not this month, last night. The world's parade is chaos, and it is evil. And it destroys our lives when we, when we run after that and try to jump into that parade. But when we make up our minds and we determine to make God number one, we jump out of that parade. He goes on to say, our break with the world will be the direct outcome of our changed relationship to God. When we change that relationship and we make him number one, that breaks us from the world and we jump right out of that parade. Isn't that great? I don't know if you've noticed this, but the world is full of sinful people that don't honor God. Shocking. <laughs> Anybody? There are even millions of people who call themselves Christians, and they pay some kind of respect to God and say things like, well, of course I love God. I don't worship the devil. I go to church. But there is a very simple test that will show if God is really honored in your life. Who wants to take the test? You ready? How to know who is number one. You are being forced into making a decision. Are you ready for the decision? The decision is between God and Money. The decision is between God and personal ambition. The decision between God and self. What do I feel like doing today? What do I think is right? What do I want? God and human love. When I was 14, I went to a conference called Acquire the Fire and um, it was our youth group. Luke and I were in youth group when we were 14 together, a long time ago. And I had this boyfriend named Mike. <laughs> and I went to this conference, and in the middle of the conference, it was great, it was powerful, it was amazing, it reminded me of how much I love Jesus. And they had people coming down and receiving ministry, and I ran down to the front, and in the middle of the ministry, they said, is there anybody here that has a relationship that they know God is saying he wants to be number one in your life, and you need to give that relationship up? And I was like, oh my gosh, that's me. It's me. And I was thinking, my boyfriend is in the stands right behind me, standing next to Luke. And um, I was like, I'm raising my hand, but I hope he doesn't see me. <laughs> so I raised my hand. I was like, I'm breaking up with that boy. I don't need a boyfriend. I need Jesus to be number one in my life. And I raised my hand. And I think afterwards, he was like, Luke told me, he was looking for you to see if you were raising your hand. And then Luke was like, I got, I didn't ride home in the same van with him. I jumped in another one because I was all awkward and a teenager. And Luke was like, hey, man, if you ever need to like hang out with somebody sometime, like trying to be there for him. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Angsty teenagers. We have to make those decisions. If we have to make a decision between God and something that we desire, we have to make God number one. It's going to determine whether or not he is honored in our lives, whether or not we have the correct order. When we decide, oh, you know what? Should I take this job? Did we ask God if that's what he wants? When we take the job and they say, oh, man, you're going to have to work every single weekend. You can't go to life group anymore. You can't go to church. Are we going to stand and say, God, is this honoring you? Is this what you want for my life? When we go on to get married to somebody, do we say, God, is this who you want me to marry? Is this the person that you've called me to fulfill my destiny with? When we get money in our pockets, do we say, God, should I give? <laughs> he said, tithe. 
Are you tithing? Are you showing that God is number one in your finances? There's every area of our life where we make a decision daily to choose whether or not he is number one. And it's by our choices that the whole world can see who we have made exalted in our lives. Amen? How many times do you think God takes second place in the lives of Christians, in the lives of people that are in this room right now, in my life? Do I make that choice and say, Am I going to deny God or am I going to deny myself? It's the proof of our lives when we make those choices. Be exalted is the language of victorious spiritual experience. It is a little key to unlock the door to great treasures of grace. It is the central in the life of a godly man. Let the seeking man reach a place where his life and lips join to continually say, be exalted. And this is the best part. A thousand minor problems will be solved all at once. Anybody have a thousand minor problems? Let your lips line up with your actions and let God be exalted in your life. The problem is we think we're going to lose something when we do that. We think we're going to lose our dignity. We think we're going to lose out on everything that we want. But the place that we lose our dignity is doing things our own way. We lost our dignity in sin. We lost our dignity in taking away God's throne and saying it's ours. And when we give it back to him and we restore that rightful place, we get to experience the blessing and the joy of what God does in our lives. He puts us in the right places. He gives us the honor that he has established for us. Sometimes we feel reluctant to surrender our will. Anybody here feel reluctant to surrender your will to somebody else? You're like, I don't want anybody else running my life. Have you seen the crazy things that people do? It makes you nervous. That's why we don't do it. But this is what Jesus said in John 8, 34. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So we're going to be servants to someone, either to God or to sin. In Romans 6, 16, it says, Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one to whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? It's crazy because we're, you know, living this life of sin, and we're so proud of our independence. I get to do whatever I want to do. And we're completely overlooking the fact that we're just weak slaves to the sin that's ruling us. We think that we have the control, but really we're slaves to that thing. But the person who surrenders to Jesus exchanges the cruel slave driver for a kind and gentle master. Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. I need that. I need to not carry heavy burdens. I need Jesus' yoke. I need him to be the one that shows me what to do and how to live. Amen? So is that clear to everybody? Do you guys get the logic behind, like, God's in charge? (laughs) That he's supposed to be the boss? Like, he made us. He was at the beginning before us. He gets to be in charge. Amen? When we take his place for ourselves, the whole course of our lives is out of joint, dislocated, Nothing will or can restore us, restore that order until our hearts make the great decision. God must be exalted. He has to be honored above everyone and everything else. So let's talk about honor next. The second point is honor follows honor. We have to establish that God is number one first, and then we're going to talk about the law of his kingdom. This is a, like a principle, kind of like the law of gravity. It's true and it exists, but we don't see it. We just see the effects of it, like we're standing. (laughs) So honor follows honor is a law of God's kingdom that he established. What is honor? Who knows what honor is? It's recognizing that, well, there's a couple ways we could do it. If we honor God and we're obedient to his word, then we're showing honor to him. If we're obedient, then we're honoring God. If we're obedient, then we're honoring God. Somebody in a high position, you honor them by respecting them and you do the things that have been established by them. So if we are going to honor God, we're going to say, God, whatever your precepts are, whatever your laws are, whatever your rules are, whatever your word is, I'm going to honor you by following that. 
So if we honor God, we are obedient to his word. Honoring God, God just shows that we have great respect and we keep his agreements. In 1 Samuel 2.30, God said this to one of the priests of Israel. He said, those who honor me, I will honor. God said, those who honor me, I will honor. And then Jesus says it in the New Testament. He says in John 12, 26, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So he's tying the Old Testament to the New Testament. And he's establishing that Jesus didn't even try to seek honor for himself. He said, if you serve me, the Father will honor you. There's a story in the Old Testament that serves as an example. So sometimes we have to see the way not to do something to learn how to do it right. Anybody ever watch somebody make mistakes and go, oh, I'm never going to do that, and then you learn? Yes. So this is a story of Eli and his, he was one of the priests of Israel and his two sons, and they were despicable people. They were extremely, Eli wasn't evil, but Eli didn't discipline his sons, and his sons were evil. And Eli knew what he was supposed to do. He knew what God's laws were, and he did not follow through and honor God by disciplining his sons. And so he was honoring what he wanted and what his sons wanted more than what God wanted. So they fail to honor God in their ministry duties. They fail to honor God in their lives. And then God sends Samuel, who was the prophet at that time, to announce the consequences. Eli didn't realize that the law of honor follows honor had been going on secretly behind the scenes because it's a kingdom law. So then this is what happens. It's judgment time. Hophni and Phinehas, who are his sons, they die in battle. The wife of Hophni dies in childbirth. Israel has to flee before her enemies. The ark of God is captured by the Philistines. And the old man, Eli, falls backward and dies of a broken neck. So complete and utter tragedy, tragedy followed Eli's failure to honor God. How many times do we honor ourselves or other people more than we honor God? But we have to compare that to almost every other Bible character that did honor God <laughs> and see what the opposite was. Think about how God overlooked weakness and failure and poured out his grace and his blessings like crazy on the people that were his servants that chose to honor him. Think about Abraham, not a perfect guy, but he honored God and God poured out his grace on his life like crazy. Jacob, David, Daniel, Elisha, whoever you want to use as an example, who honored God. The honor that they had for God was followed by honor in their lives. And it was just like as if you plant a seed and you know a harvest is going to come. If you honor God, honor will follow your life. When a man of God sets his heart to honor God above all, God accepts his intention as fact and he acts accordingly. Not perfection. He doesn't expect perfection. I'm so thankful because I'm not perfect. But holy intention makes the difference. Isn't that awesome? Jesus was the perfect example. He did, he did it exactly the way he was supposed to do it, but even he didn't seek honor for himself. He honored God in everything that he did. He was obedient to the Father in everything, and he did that so he could, be, he could serve as an example for us. I'm not going to read this whole section right here, but one of the things that Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes only from God. And what Jesus was saying there was, you are never gonna get that I'm Jesus, the Messiah, the one that came to save you from your sins. You're never gonna get that and you're never gonna be able to believe because all you're worried about is getting honor and glory for yourself and receiving that from other people instead of recognizing that your honor has to go to God. Your obedience has to go to God. I don't wanna be somebody that misses out on what God can do in my life because I am so focused on receiving honor from other people or just honoring myself above God. Amen? Tozer says the whole course of their life is upset by failure to put God where he belongs. We exalt ourselves instead of God and the curse follows. Say that's not me. When we put God in the place of honor in our lives, we receive our place of honor with him. And that is an incredible promise for our lives and for the lives of our family. Amen? Last point. So we talked about making God number one and how we can give honor and receive honor. But now we have to not only be restored, but help to restore others. 
We have to recognize that as we're pursuing God and we, we're making our desire for him, that God also has desires. Have you ever thought about that? That God desires specific things. Who would like to know what he desires? Yes, great, I'm going to tell you. His desire is towards people, and more specifically, his desire is towards people who are willing to make him number one above all. So he is looking for people that will choose to put him as number one in their lives. That's precious to him because this is so cool. Those people that choose to make him number one, they create a place for God to pour out the kindness that we can receive in Jesus, everything that he has for us, and then he gets to walk with us unhindered. Say unhindered. He gets to act towards us like the God that he is supposed to be. Can you imagine how awesome it would be to say, God walks with me unhindered? Have you ever walked with your children anywhere? Anybody have children that you've just tried to walk down a sidewalk with? And they're like walking like this, turned around. They're walking in front of you. They're stepping on your feet. They're stepping on your heels. That is walking hindered. Hindered. (laughs) But God is saying, When you make me number one, I get to walk with you unhindered. That means he gets to do the things that he wants to do. Can you imagine trying to, God trying to walk with us and all we're doing is getting in the way and trying to do our own thing and making everything hard for him? You guys have to think this is your actual life. So are you making, are you hindering God walking with you or are you able to walk with him unhindered? I think the more exciting thing is God is looking for people that have a desire for him. And if we line up with God, then our desire is to find those people and help them restore their relationship with God too. I wanna read you some scriptures about God's desire for souls. Second Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. First Timothy 2, one through four, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. How many people does he want? All people. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Luke 19, 10 says, Jesus said, for the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. Matthew 18, 11 through 13 says, if a man has a hundred sheep, this is Jesus talking, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than the 99 that didn't wander away. Jude 123 says, save others by snatching them from the fire. Proverbs 1130 says, the fruit of the righteous is like a tree producing life, and the one who wins souls is wise. And this last one, you might have heard it a few times. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God has desires too, and his desire is that people will be with him and that the relationship will be restored to its proper and correct order. I promise you one of the greatest things that has helped me personally understand how to put my relationship in the right order with God has been doing ministry. And I'm not talking about worship team ministry or kids church ministry or administrating the church. I'm talking about helping people, serving them, and helping them know the love of God. By being somebody that's just on the journey with them, trying to keep this relationship correct, and helping them restore their relationship with God. What if we were people that were praying for and loving and helping the people all around us so that they could be saved and come into a restored, correct relationship with God? And then helping them have that correct order in their lives so that God could walk with them unhindered. So that dislocation and that pain and that misery that surrounds them in the world could come to harmony. That they could have the blessings on their lives that come from honoring God, not on just their lives, but on the lives of their children and on their family that creates a legacy for you and for them, amen? 
Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to be a servant and that's the example that he gave for us. He didn't honor himself. He honored God by being obedient to him. And now we get to have that same incredible joy that Jesus had going to the cross, knowing that the only thing that he could do to have the joy of our salvation was to give up his life. We can have that same joy when we make God's de- desires for souls our desire. Amen? In Psalm 37, 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When we start delighting ourselves in the Lord and honoring him, then the, the desires of our heart start becoming the same desires as his. And we can see those things happen in our lives. Amen? Let's go ahead and be standing. So who do we have to begin with? We have to begin with God. Everybody say God. And honor is going to follow honor. And when we receive that restoration, then we can help restore others. But I want to I wanna caution you just a little bit. Sometimes it's easy to hear a message like this and be convinced in your mind that it's something that you want to do. But before we can actually make God number one, We have to allow God to win our hearts over first. Trying to take on the position of making God number one above all is not an easy task because you're going to start trying to do it and then you're going to realize how divided your heart is. You're going to be, you'll, you'll feel it today. You'll walk out of this place and you'll feel how your heart is divided for what your flesh wants versus what God wants. But when you just make that decision and the whole of who you are makes that decision with you, then your heart can be satisfied. God wants all of you and he's not going to rest until he gets all of you. He doesn't want just one little part of you. He wants the whole thing. So we're going to pray over all of this. And if this is something that you're serious about, then I just want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to take the time as we're praying and to imagine you taking your whole self and putting it at the foot of the cross throwing yourself at the feet of Jesus and meaning everything in this prayer. As I pray it over you, just allow this to be something that's sincere in your heart. Because when we are sincere and we bring that holy intention before God, He's going to accept that. And He's going to fulfill His promise of helping us with His grace. Amen. I want to read you this last quote as you close your eyes and bow your heads. Tozer says, God will unveil his glory before us and he will place all his treasures for our use when we have this attitude because he knows that his honor is safe in such consecrated hands. Lord, we ask today that you would help us to be those people with consecrated hands that you can trust that your honor is safe in our hands that we would honor you with every part of our lives, that we would be obedient to you, to your word, that we would exalt you in our lives and make you number one above all things. I want to pray this prayer over you and allow this to be the prayer of your heart as I say these words. Oh God, be exalted over my possessions. Nothing of earth's treasures shall seem dear unto me if only you are glorified in my life. Be exalted over my friendships. I am determined that you will be above all, though I must stand deserted and alone in the midst of the earth. Be exalted above my comforts, though it means the loss of bodily comforts and the carrying of heavy crosses. I will keep my vow made this day before you. Be exalted over my reputation. Make me ambitious to please you, even if as a result, I must sink into obscurity and my name be forgotten as a dream. Rise, O Lord, into your proper place of honor, above my ambitions, above my likes and dislikes, above my family, my health, and even my life itself. Let me decrease that you would increase. Let me sink that you would rise above. And Jesus, just like when you rode into Jerusalem on a humble donkey, let me carry you wherever I go and hear the people cry to you, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we just give you our lives right now. We take our whole person, our whole personality, and we ask that you would help us to conform to your image, that we would no longer try to force you to be what we want you to be, but that you would be who you are in our lives. 
And we give you this time, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, let's give the Lord some praise. If you are here this morning and you have never given your life to Jesus before, you can do that right now. We've been talking about it this entire time. This whole idea of making God number one exalted in our life starts right here. And I'm going to tell you how you can do it. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Of the glory of God. Every single one of us has sinned and made mistakes. And Jesus knew that there was no other way that we could be with the Father for eternity if we had sin in our lives because God is perfection. And we cannot be in the presence of perfection when we have sin on us. The Bible says that the wages of that sin, the consequences of it, is death. And that's not talking about dying in this, this life. It's talking about being separate, separated from God for all eternity in a place called hell. And God doesn't desire that we be separated from him. He desires that we would be with him. So he did something incredible. And the Bible says that God commanded his great love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died on the cross for our sins. We couldn't pay the penalty. It was too high. The price was death. And that's why Jesus came. He was born of a virgin. He never sinned. He lived a perfect life. And then he offered himself in our place. You see, another person can't pay the price for a guilty person because we're all guilty. But Jesus in his innocence could offer himself because he never sinned and he was perfect. That's why he gave himself for us. And at the end of his life, they took him, they stripped him of his clothes, they strapped him to a post, they beat him with a whip that ripped the flesh from his body. Everything that he went through, we deserved. It was the price that was being paid for our sins. But that's how much he loved us. After the beating, they put the cross on his back and he carried it to Calvary. They stretched him out on the cross and they put nails in his hands and his feet. And they raised it up and he hung there suffering. For over six hours, he was suffering for our sins, my sins, and your sins. At the end of that time, he said, it is finished, and he gave up his life. And what he meant when he said that was the penalty has been paid. And the Bible says that if you believe that in your heart and you confess that with your mouth, that you will be saved. What does it mean to be saved? It means that when you die at the end of your life, that you get to spend eternity in heaven with God. But what happens today is that you are forgiven for all of your sins. All of your sin and shame is forgotten by God. It is wiped away and you are a new person. And he comes and he lives in your life. So if that's something you wanna to do today, you've never accepted Jesus as your savior and this is your first time and you would like to make that choice, then on the count of three, I'm gonna have you raise your hand and we're just gonna celebrate with you and pray with you. On the count of three, go ahead and raise your hand. One, two, three. All right. Maybe you've, ne you've given your life to Jesus before and you're here today and you're thinking, man, I have walked away from God. I have not been serving him. I made that choice a long time ago, but I, I'm just not doing it anymore. I just want you to know that God loves you so much and he is so glad you're here. And if you wanna rededicate your life today, then you can make that choice as well. If you'd like to rededicate your life, then on the count of three, you can raise your hand. One, two, three. All right. You guys, we are more excited than that. So when somebody gives their life to Jesus, we celebrate, amen? Anybody else, you wanna give your life to Jesus for the first time, first time salvation, you can raise your hand. Anybody else? You wanna make sure that that relationship is in the correct order. You can raise your hand to rededicate or to give your life to Jesus for the first time. I see another hand, all right, yeah, awesome. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to do something bold. I'm gonna ask you to come to the front so I can pray with you. You don't, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna make you speak into the mic and you can bring somebody with you. I'm just gonna have you guys come up to the front and I'm gonna pray with you. Let's go ahead and give them a round of applause. All right, guys, we're gonna pray together. The whole church is gonna pray with us and I'm just gonna ask you to uh, repeat after me this prayer and just believe in your hearts. We're gonna confess it and the Bible says that is what brings us in right relationship with God. So go ahead and close your eyes and bow your heads. Lord Jesus, thank you 
for the work that you did at the cross, paying the price for my sins. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you so much for these people standing at the altar this morning. Lord, I thank you that right now at this moment, they are new creations. The Bible says, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is not a second chance, but a new beginning. Lord, I thank you so much for what you're doing in their lives. I pray for blessings on their lives, protection, and healing over their entire bodies. Lord, we give you this time and these people, and we are so thankful for what you're doing. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's celebrate that. That is so exciting. We want to help others have a restored relationship with God. It will bring joy to your life. It brings joy to my life. It's who we're created to be, amen? Let's pray and go out and continue to do the work. Let's make that order of our relationship with God proper and correct, and let's help restore others to have that same relationship, amen? Lord, we thank you so much for this morning and for what you're doing in the lives of everyone here. We pray that you would help us to continue to remember these things, that you would bring conviction to our hearts as we go throughout this week to keep making these choices. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in victory.